the 10th chapter. Matthew, the 10th chapter, we're going to start at verse 16. If you do not have your Bible with you, it's uh, printed in the bulletin at the back of the bulletin. Matthew 10, verse 16 through 23. Matthew 10, verse 16 through 23. And that is the new King James Version of the Bible that we're going to be reading from. So please stand for the reading of God's Word. Uh, Matthew 10, verse 16 through 23, found in the bulletin also in the Word of God. It reads as follows Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my name's sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now, brother, will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child, and, a, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another, for surely I say to you, you will not, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Amen. Amen. I like to preach for a few minutes on the subject when wolves attack. When wolves attack. Let us bow our hands for a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for allowing us to be in your presence. Thank you for these your people who have come out today to hear your word. And Heavenly Father, let this uh, scripture, let this message, Lord, uh, make a mark upon them that cannot be erased that we can live the life that you want us to live, and that is the Christian life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. When wolves attack, as you know, we are studying and going through uh, the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have been doing this since the beginning of the church in 2011. And we have uh, stated that Jesus' ministry, and if you know anything, you Bible scholars and those who study the Bible know that Jesus' ministry lasted three and a half years while he was on this earth. So I wanted to go through those three and a half years of his ministry, which covers Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and uh, we, we put it in chronological order so you can understand it, and we thank God for that. So now, we've covered, and we said it this way, uh, each season represented one year. So we said season one was the first year and a half. So we are currently in season two, near the end of season two. And hopefully next year we will get into the last year of Jesus' ministry. But we are now at a point in chapter 10 in Matthew where we're in the second year and a half of Jesus' ministry. And now they have only maybe one more year to be with him. But he now sends them out. He sends the 12 out. That's what the 10th chapter is about. It's about evangelism. It's about Jesus calling them and sending them out. So really, chapter 10 is about this internship. And he sends these 12 out. And we talked about it in the past couple of weeks about the mission about what the mission of the church is and, and what we're supposed to do in Christ. And today we're going to continue with that theme or understanding what evangelism is. But there's one thing that you need to understand as born-again believers, is that, and that's this, that no matter where you live, you are going to be attacked by the devil. And that's something you need to accept. You're going to receive opposition against the world. You're going to receive hatred and you're going to receive threats from the world because you believe and you have faith in Jesus Christ. So as we go through this message today, there's a couple of points we can go through and you can write them down. And the first point is this. We as born again believers must understand that when wolves attack, we must protect ourselves. We must protect ourselves. Verse 16 says this, Behold, I send you out as sheep 
in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be as be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We have been sent out by Jesus Christ to proclaim the gospel. We've been sent out to tell the dying world that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Now, in doing this, we are exposed to the fiery darts of the devil. We are exposed to Satan's kingdom to try to stop us from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And unless the sheep are protected by the shepherd in the midst of persecution, we will all be devoured by his ways. And now, but there are some things that we can do as born again believers to, to stay away from or to kind to help us while we go through some of this attacks is this. You can put on the whole armor of God. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And you know what the wiles of the devil are, don't you? The Greek word for the wiles means there's a trick. You can stand against the tricks of the devil. You can stand against the strategies of the devil that's trying to bring you down. That's one way you can deal with opposition. Another way you can deal with opposition is this. You can learn the word of God. Amen. See, if you don't know God's word, how are you going to fight the devil and you don't even know God's word yourself? How are you going to tell him to get away from you and you don't know what scripture to use to tell him to get away from you? It's, it's Matthew. Matthew 7 uh, verse 15 says this. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So in other words, you should be able to tell which one is a wolf and which one is the sheep. And if you can't tell the sheep from the wolf, then you need to learn a little bit more about the word of God. As a matter of fact, 1 John, 1 John, the fourth chapter in verse 1 says this, you need to try the spirit by the spirit. In other words, you got to test to see whether what the spirit is of God or not. He said it this way, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Uh, it was Timothy, 2 Timothy told us this, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. See, but doing these things, we are ensuring ourselves that we are doing what? We are protecting ourselves against these wilds or these uh, wolves that are going to attack you. My next question to you is this. Why would Jesus tell us to be wise as serpents? Nobody wants to use a snake as a representative for anything. Because we always look at snakes as being evil, or we, uh, we hear snakes being used in an evil manner, but Jesus didn't use them in an evil manner. Jesus says, I want you to be wise as serpents. And so let's, let's see, why would Jesus tell us that? Let's, let's look at a serpent. Let's look at snakes. What, what do snakes do? Serpents or snakes move with little vision. And I, didn't know, I don't know if you knew that, that snakes could hardly see. So they have to rely on their smell and their instinct just to get around, just to get through. And so in other words, every move that a serpent makes, it is calculated and it is cautious. So the snake has to be cautious because he really don't know where he's going because he's trying to use his smell and his intellect to get him through. But the Bible says in Ephesians 5.15, see then that you walk circumspectively, not as fools, but as wise. Circum circumspectively means this, to be cautious. You need to be cautious with the word of God, just like the serpent is cautious the way he walks. In other words, he says, be wise, be as wise as a serpent. I want you to move and be on alert like a serpent is. And you gotta be cautious like serpents are cautious. Not only did he say that, he says, not only should you be cautious when it comes down to the word of God, he says, be as wise as serpents, but be as harmless as doves. Now, what do doves represent? Doves represent love. 
Doves represent peace, often used in the Bible to illustrate God's pleasure with men. So whatever we do, we need to have the heart and love of God so we can spread that love to everybody else. And meaning this, God wants you to be able to love people even when they're doing you wrong. God wants you to be able to love people even when they are talking against you, even when they are lying on you. He wants you to love them anyhow. So yeah, this, this serpent emblem was an emblem of wisdom and intellect and keenness. But just remember this, we are to be wise but not vengeful. We are to be innocent but don't be a doormat. You know, do you hear what I just said? Don't be a doormat. You are to be innocent. But don't let folks walk all over you. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Some people think that just because we Christians that people can just walk all over us. No. He didn't say don't be a fool. He says be a dove. Well, what does that mean? That means this. Don't let people try to use your kindness for weakness. Don't let people think that you don't know what you're doing because you're living for Jesus Christ and they can take advantage of you any kind of way. Uh -uh. He says be as wise as serpents and I want you to be as uh, harmless as doves. So since we know that, since we know now that we are protected, listen, my second point is this. Because you're going to be protected, here's another point. You must suffer persecution. That means you can't stop the wolves from coming. You're going to be attacked. You're going to be attacked by them. And I haven't told you who all the wolves are. We're going to get to that in a minute. But you will be attacked. So we should prepare ourselves for persecution. It was Martin Luther King Jr. who said this. He said, listen, uh, we, he said this years ago, before he even became famous uh, as a civil rights leader, he said this. He said, we are doing a poor service in teaching our children that success is the best and that you got to be on top. He says, we need to be telling our children that failure is just as much a part of life as success. You see, if you, you run around telling your kid, everybody love them, I love you, and we love you. Listen, everybody don't love your kids. And everybody don't think your kid's cute. Yeah, you can tell your kids they're cute. You can tell them that you love them, but everybody don't see that in your kids. And but see, you got to prepare your kid for that. Listen, listen, Johnny, listen. Everybody don't like you like daddy like no, no, yeah, yeah, I'll open every door I can for you, but sometimes you'll get some doors closed in your face. And, and no, no, it's no, that's not the time for you to commit suicide. No, you just got to move on. You got to remember that there is failure. You're going to get some letdowns in life. You're going to have some failures in life. And guess what? Some people will try to set you up. That's right, Johnny. Some people don't even want to see you succeed. So they're going to set you up. And you got to be okay with people not like you, liking you enough to even get rid of you. Some people want to do you physical harm. Some people want to hurt you physically. And you got to be okay with that. And just what? Prepare yourself for it. And that's what Christians, I don't know, you might be watching the prosperity gospel preachers on television telling you you're going to be a millionaire. They're telling you you don't supposed to be sick. And they're telling you you don't supposed to be going through anything. I've never found that in the scripture anywhere that every Christian, when you come to Jesus Christ, is supposed to have a million dollars in your pocket. And that every day going to be sunny and that there's no rain in your life. Well, let me tell you the, the real story is this. When you meet Jesus, trouble is on its way. Well, I had trouble before I met Jesus. Well, you got some more trouble coming. Because the trouble you had before you met Jesus was the trouble that we caused, but the trouble that you're going to get after you meet him is the trouble because you are his child. Because you are following him. See, they didn't tell me that, so I don't know about this Christianity thing. Because did nobody tell me that I was going to get into trouble. I thought when I had God in my life, he's going to protect me from all harm and all persecution. No. That's not what scripture says. It says he'll be there to help you through the trial. He'll be there to help you through the storm. He'll be there to help you through the persecution. So listen, listen, we got to suffer persecution. Notice what it says in verse 17 and 18 in our passage. It says this, be but beware of men. 
For they will deliver you up to councils, and they will whip you, that's what scourge means, in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Did you hear what he said? He says that men are going to do this. Now here's a news flash for you from verse 17. You want to know who the wolves are? The wolves that are going to attack you, they are people. That's who are going to, the wolves are unsaved people. You say, well, I thought it was the demons. Yes, it is the demons. The Bible says this in Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against rulers and, and wickedness in high places. But have you ever thought what the demons use to get to you? They use people. You've never seen a dog run up to you and say, listen, I'm, 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 sent, I'm a demon inside of a dog, so I'm really here to attack you because you're a Christian. No, they don't do it that way. The demons get inside of unsaved people, and they use them to attack you. See, you guys have been watching The Exorcist too long. See, that's what y'all think demonology is. You think demon possession is somebody's head turning around, throwing up green vomit, and all this kind of stuff, and trying to scare you to death. No, stay out of the, look, I know y'all going to the Halloween and haunted houses, but that's not where the demons are. They're not in there. That's all the setup. The demons are everyday people being used to get you to stop serving God. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, they, they don't look messed up. They call, they sugar shower. They pretty and they fine. Yes, they are. These are the demons that come up to you. Yeah, come on, hang out with me tonight. We going to the club. No, you ain't gotta go to Bible class. No, stop. No, no. You going with me tonight? Yeah, I am kind of tired. I need to get my drink on tonight. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'll tell Pastor. I'll see you next Tuesday. So that's, that's people are the ones that Satan will send your way to get you to stop doing God's will. So it's through people that Satan sends persecution. So listen to this. Not only will people say bad things about you, they will try to do bad things to you. It says in that passage of scripture that they were, they whipped them. He said they're going to take you into, in front of our governors and kings and they're going to whip you. Now, we haven't seen that here in America, but can I tell you this? That Christians in other parts of the world are being tortured. And you see it on the news. You see it on the news, those Christians that was in the mountains and uh, they were trying to get down and then the, the, uh, the air, ISIS, wherever they were, was trying to stop them from coming down. They had guns pointed toward them saying, you can't come off the mountain. Well, these people were starving to death, and America had to go and send relief packages and drop them on the mountain so these Christians could kind of survive. But my question is, look, don't drop the food on it. Get a little thin or F-15 or something and shoot everybody around the mountain so they can come down the mountain. Don't give me no relief package. I'm trying to get off the mountain. <laughs> I don't need no bottle of water. We trying to get down so we can keep praying. But guess what? That's what Satan will do. He is the one that's going to set up these little schemes and scams and as we say, tricks from the devil to get you to stop doing God's will. And you better thank God that you live in the United States of America. And I, and I, you, I hear people complain about America all they want to. Go live in Africa. Yeah, yeah. Go to Asia right now. I want you to go to Afghanistan and you'll be running right back over here as fast as you can. This is the best country in the world today. This is the, I don't care what you're talking about. We have freedom of religion. We have freedom of speech. Nobody's trying to kill you for walking down the street with a Bible in your hand. You live in the best country in the world today. So while you're trying to leave here and talk about you can't stay in America, and, and, and it's the government trying to keep us down, and you know some people, when you talk about race, it's this race against that race. Go to another country, and you really see how bad it can really get. Christians are dying every day. We live in a blessed country. I don't know how long it will last that we as Christians will have this freedom. Because as you know, our rights are being taken away from us. As you know, if you watch the news, people are becoming more intolerant of you as Christians because of what you stand for. 
You say, oh, no, no, that's not true. It is true. We have something called the separation of church and state in the United States. But it seems like back in the 60s where it started, that when we tried to argue, it started with an argument about prayer in school. Did you, did you notice that? In the 60s, now you can't pray in school anymore. Then it went from prayer in school to you know what, I don't like the Ten Commandments in the courtroom. So they took the Ten Commandments down from the courtroom. You know what, oh yeah, that little inscription on your money that says, in God we trust, we're going to take that off too. Anything that deal with God, anything that deal with Christianity is being slowly and surely taken away. Now, now, and rightfully so, and rightfully so, because we were, we tricked ourselves in the first place to believe that everybody in America are Christians. Who told you that this was a Christian nation in the first place? Who told you that everybody loved Jesus in America? Everybody don't love Jesus in America. And you're right, why should we have prayer in the school? Because if we have prayer in school, little Susie gonna pray to Jesus on Monday, but little Alibaba gonna come and pray to Allah on Tuesday. And Johnny G, Johnny Sin is gonna come and pray to Buddha on Wednesday. Now, are you gonna subject your child to Buddha and to Muhammad on the days that they, your kids go to school? I don't want to. Uh, it's public school, so the right is right. If you're going to have prayer in school, well, that family believes in Satan worship. So they pray to Satan now, well, okay, PA. Okay, listen, children, we have little Johnny uh, James. He's going to come today. He's going to do the prayer today. But as you know, we believe in freedom of religion. So it's Johnny's turn to pray to Satan today. So here, Johnny, you ready? Here you go. And so Johnny, and Johnny goes up, you are appalled. You want to pull your kid out of school? You want to do that? This is why, why I tell you, guess where prayer starts? It don't start in school, it starts at home. That's where prayer starts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless you want to send your kid to a Christian school, you better say, thank God we pray at home and not at school. Because we don't live in a country anymore. See, listen, America has changed. We could have got away with that in the 60s and the 50s when everybody praying to Jesus and God. But we can't live like that anymore because other religions are here and they have a right to public worship just like you have a right to public worship. So that's why you need to pray at home. And that's why you need to teach your children at home. And that's why you need to bring them to church. So they can learn about sexuality here. Because they're going to learn it about out there too. And they're going to say it's okay for Sally and Lisa to be together out there. They're going to learn that out there it's okay for Johnny and Jim to be okay with each other. But see, in the house of God, we don't teach that. So this is where you need to teach your children, and because of all of our beliefs, the wolves will attack. And they are going to come after you. And, and I don't know why we're surprised because Jesus said this. He said this in John 15, 18. If the world hate you, you know that they hated me first before they hated you. That's what Jesus said. Luke 6, 22. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, when they shall uh, separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. They're going to say you evil just because you're a Christian. And we haven't seen that in large numbers yet in America, but around the world, they have seen it. So the battle, the battle between God and the world is raging. It's a silent battle. It's being fought all the time, fought all the time. And you need to know wolves will attack at that moment. Point number three, watch this. So not only will they attack you, we have no excuse. Point number three, we have no excuse when facing the world. There is no excuse that we have in saying, I can't tell somebody about Jesus. Look at 19 and 20. Look at verse 19 and 20. He says this, but when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Did you know that the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you? Did you know that the Holy Spirit is the one who guides you and in each and every day of your life? So uh, you hear me say this all the time. When it comes down to witnessing and telling somebody about Jesus, let the Holy Spirit guide you. 
Because when you walk up to a person, you don't have to walk up to every person you see. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? You don't have to have a billboard sign on the front and the back of you saying, if you on, on the front it says, going to heaven is so glad. And on the back, if you don't know Jesus, you're going to hell. You don't need that. All you need is the power of the Holy Spirit, right? God puts you in a lot of situations where that conversation just opens up all by itself. Somebody might say, you know, every time I come to work, when I go to work, some people say every time they come to work, they say, Eli, we see you, and you, you don't look down, and you're always happy about something. See, that open up a conversation. Why are you always smiling all the time? Well, he woke me up this morning, and, and he started on my way. Well, who is he, the man who made the alarm clock? No, I ain't talking about him. I'm talking about God who woke all us up in, in the morning time. And then when people find out that I'm a minister, as soon as something negative goes and they're wrong in their life, they come around, they come and ask you, please pray for me. Yeah. Please pray for my family. Please pray for this situation that I'm going through. And for me to say no to them is not being a Christian. You need to say yes every time somebody asks you to help them because you don't know if it was that one last thing that you did that caused them to say, I need Jesus in my life. Oh yeah, so he's going to give you, he's going to give you the words to say, I remember it was uh, it was Moses. Moses tried to play dumb when God called him. Remember, he tried to play dumb. Lord, I, I can't talk for you. This is what Moses said in Exodus 4, 10 through 12. And Moses said unto the Lord, Oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who maketh man, who make who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou should say. So you don't have to have a PhD to tell somebody about Jesus. You, you don't have to go through evangelism classes to tell somebody about Jesus. Well, what do I say? Tell them what he has done for you. Tell them how he delivered you. Tell them how he changed your life. Tell them how he took you from sin and brought you into his grace. Tell them how God turned you around. That's all you got to do. Give your testimony. Tell them what he's done for you. So, see, God will give you what you need. But this is what you need to do. You do need to do some things before you talk to people. You got to be prayed up. That's what you got to be. You got to be prayed up. You got to be studied up as well. So, yeah, yeah. See, it's somewhere in the Bible that says, no, see, they, people know what you're talking about when you're talking somewhere in the Bible. You can be making it up as, as you speak. Somewhere in the Bible is this book called Blessings. No, that's not nowhere in the Bible. Don't let people get away with it. Somewhere it says, somewhere that you, the, no, tell me where it says it. Put it in its correct context. Don't take scripture out of context, which a lot of people do. Take one verse and run away with it and don't even know what the word, what the verse really means. So before you talk to people, you got to have something on the inside of you to talk to them about. That's what he's saying here. You got to pray up, study up, and open yourself to God's will. Listen, uh, there's nothing that God is going to put you through that you won't be able to get out of. 1 Corinthians, write this down, chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to, to bear. The provision for our time and perils is this, trust in God. Whenever you're going through any persecution, whenever you are being attacked by the wolves of Satan, you need to trust God because, as I said, the attacks are coming. There's nothing that you can do to stop them. You can't pray your way out of it. You can't sing your way out of it. You're going to go through a storm. You're going to go through some trials. You're going to go through some tribulations. So why not just have Jesus to go right along with you? Why don't you call on him when you're going through? Why don't you call on him when the devil is attacking you? Because he's the only one that can bring you out anyway. He's the only one that can see you through. And last but not least, listen to this. Not only are we going to be attacked 
by the devil. We must endure. You got to endure the attacks. Watch this. Look at verse 21 through 23. Last three verses. Now, brother, will deliver a brother to death. And a father, his child, and children were raised up against parents and caused them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he, here it is, right on the line this, but he who endures to the end will be saved. And when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Listen, the word betray, this is interesting. Uh, one commentator tried to say when it says the father against his brother, brother against his sister, and sister against a brother, father against son, and all that. Listen, some people have thought thought they were talking about spousal abuse or child abuse. That's not what he's talking about. And we don't see this action in our day today. And some people around the world do see this action. This is what he's talking about. Some people, and I'm talking about people around the world, maybe a Muslim family, one person in a Muslim family gets saved and accepts Jesus Christ as their savior. They, it's their own family member that turns against them and tells the authorities or tell the government, my, my brother or my sister or my father or my mother has now began to follow Christ, therefore come and arrest them. He says that's going to become more prevalent. We don't have to worry about that much here in America because there are no laws against being a Christian. But in other countries, there are. There are other countries, people are worshiping God in caves. In other countries, people are hiding out just to read one Bible. And we can't even come to church on time. And you got people around the world who is risking their life to read the book that you can read every single day. Now, the Bible is still the number one selling book in the world. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's not that book, the great book. No, it's not that book. That's not the number one book in the world. The number one book in the world is still the Bible. Shades of Grey. I know y'all read that book already. They ain't not the name the movie out of it. Listen, that's not the number one book in the world. It's the Bible. And he said, well, I don't see people in America buying it. People in Africa are buying it. People are, are getting it. People in Asia are getting it. People in the Middle East are getting it. And you all, we playing around with the Bible. They're serious about the Bible because they are losing their life over this book we call the Word of God. And because we haven't seen no persecution in almost 200 years in this country because of Christianity, because we have freedom of religion, nobody going to knock on your door and say, listen, I'm, you going to jail because you got the Bible in your house. I really want to know how many people will come to church if they pass the law that says you can't serve Jesus no more because they're against homosexuality. I wonder how many people stop coming to church because of that. I'll be up here by myself like, Lord, what done happened to the people in, in the church? This was a good sermon today, but they, they didn't come because of the law. Now listen, remember, we're going to arrest you, and we're going to charge you $1,000 for preaching against homosexuality. I guess I'm going to uh, tell my wife, listen, you got to put the house up. And uh, give me she's like, what? Put the house up? Well, we're going to see you in about a couple of years. Because uh, I got to have a place to stay. She wouldn't do that. She would be right there with me, and she will put the house up. She'll do whatever she has to do, because guess what? God comes first. God's word comes first. We haven't seen those days. And I'm not saying it's not going to happen in America, but the scripture here, and I want to really pinpoint what he's coming to, in the last days, after the rapture of the church, you're going to see a high volume of this. You're going to see a high volume of father turning against the daughter, the daughter turning against the mother, because one is saved and one is not. That's what he's talking about. In the tribulation period, people are going to sell each other out. Family members are going to sell each other out. And God is saying this, you better thank God you live in grace right now. You better thank God you live in a country and a time that you have the freedom to serve him because there is a time coming when that freedom won't be there. So I, I don't play around with grace. I don't play around with the church. I'm in it to win it. I'm in it to give my life to Christ. I'm not going to play around with God. Because I know there's some other people that are not playing around with God. And this, here's another thing. Don't look at somebody else in this country because they playing around with God. You think you're going to play around with God. Well, she got away with it. She go to the bar every week. 
and she get away with it, but she is not you, and the way God deals for her, he's not going to deal with you the same way. Don't worry about her, worry about you. He said, he that endures to the end will be saved. Matthew 10, 33 says, but whosoever shall not, de whosoever shall deny me before men, I will deny before my father. Listen, you got to endure to the end. You got to keep telling people until the end. What end? Your end. Your end. My rapture can happen tonight. My rapture can happen tomorrow. I'm not promised tomorrow. I can die tonight, tomorrow, any second. So every chance I get, I'm going to let my light shine. Every chance I get, I'm going to endure until the end. That's the people that's going to make it. By this statement, endure to the end, Jesus is giving you assurance that he'll be with you through the persecution. Listen, yeah, your family may be, your family may attack you. They will ostracize you. They may criticize you. They may even call you names. But listen to this. Listen to this promise. Jesus said in Luke 18, Jesus replied, I assure you that everyone who has given up house or wife or brothers or parents or children for my sake and the kingdom's sake, they will be repaid many times over in this life and will have eternal life in the world to come. Isn't God good? And so, so guess what? You, you can't worry about family members and you can't worry about co-workers and you can't worry about friends. You need to live a life of Jesus Christ all by yourself because when you stand before God, your mama not going to be standing with you. Now, see, Jesus, the reason my baby's standing here, she, she was like, she's 60, you ain't. Now, see, my baby's standing here because she, no, your mama can't help you on that day. You know, I'm a principal, and every reason I do this, I'm a principal of a school. I see parent after parent coming up to my school for a 21-year-old student trying to make excuses why they didn't come to school for a whole month. See, what had happened was I needed him to know while you trying to get him to go shopping for you, he not your husband, he your son. And then now he's missing out on his education. He's missing out on this. She's missing out on that. And listen to this. You can't do that with God. Your parents can't stand for you when you stand before God. Nobody's going to be standing there but you and God. And you got to give an account for everything that you did in the body that he gave you. So listen, listen, listen what he says. He says, listen, and this is the last but not least. You, you got to understand this. There's something that we need to know. The reason when wolves attack, don't worry about it because you're more than a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror through Christ in his name. The Bible says this in Romans 8.31. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can be against us? So as Christians, we are more than conquerors when wolves attack. We, we, we may get pushed down when wolves attack. We may be get pushed around when wolves attack, but you are more than a conqueror. We may get threatened, we may get harassed, but you're more than a conqueror through Christ who is in you. But we cannot be defeated. How many of you know that? Nobody can defeat you. They can hurt your body, but they can't hurt your soul. They can take your house, but they can't take your soul. They can take your job, but they can't take your soul. They can mess with your mind, but they can't mess with your soul. They can mess with your bank account, but they can't mess with your soul. You're more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. So yes, yes, when wolves attack, don't worry about this, tell them this. Yeah, you, you might have won the battle, but Jesus won the war. That's right. You attack, you knock me down this time, but Jesus gonna put you out. Yeah, yeah. Jesus gonna put you down in hell, burning in fire and, and brimstone. Now listen to this. If you're more than a conqueror and God is on your side, then why are you afraid? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to live for Jesus. Don't be afraid of the world. Don't be uh, not bold to tell somebody that Jesus Christ is real for you. You know what? I see people all the time, they are bold in whatever they do. I see people when they go out to the game today, they don't go out there, they lie and get on, they bold. They bold. They're going to tell you the Lions going to win, they bold. They got their gear on because they think they're going to win. Even though the Lions may lose, they still believe they're winners and they got the gear on. How come we don't do that for Jesus? How come we don't get up every day? I'm a winner for Jesus. When your Jesus